welcome to the Whole Story Podcast. This podcast series is focused on inspiring sustainability in agriculture using the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, also known as the SDGs. Each week, our guests are invited to share their story, highlight a particular one of the 17 goals, and leave us with some practical tips for sustainability on farms. I'm Bex Smith, founder of The Whole Story, a B Corp certified social enterprise inspiring, facilitating, and articulating holistic sustainability in agriculture. And this podcast has been brought to life in partnership with the incredible team at FMG, who are passionate about partnering with organisations like The Whole Story, so together we can support rural New Zealand. So whatever you're doing while listening to this episode, thanks for choosing us. The best way you can support our mahi is to follow and share the show on whatever app you're listening on, and I hope this episode leaves you inspired and excited about the bigger picture of sustainability in agriculture. Today on the Whole Story podcast, I catch up with Alison Dews, a fellow veterinarian, farmer, mother of three children, and passionate holistic systems thinker. Alison comes from a background of multi-generational dairy farming, and she herself has farmed both here and in Australia. Her approach to problems with her veterinary diagnostic hat on and her One Health lens from mountains to sea provide her with a fascinating insight into how we look at ecosystems and problem solve at the root cause. This has led her to set up her own agricultural consultancy called Tipu Whenua. This episode is based around the UN Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water, but it more specifically refers to how we can serve and sustainably use the oceans, seas and marine resources, with particular reference to how we avoid negative impacts as a result of land use on these ecosystems. Alison is fiercely passionate about ecosystem restoration, working with farmers to provide practical solutions and holistic sustainability. So for me, this was a very selfish conversation, as I really enjoyed every topic we covered, and I feel so in alignment with Alison. I know you all will also connect with Alison in this conversation, and that you'll be really excited to hear more about the work she is doing and the future work she has planned for the next 12 months. Welcome along today, everybody. I would like to introduce you to Alison Jews today. So welcome, Alison. Kia ora. Gilda, so I would like to really kick into this, starting off with the story of Alison Jews. Thanks, Bex. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a big family with a father as a vet. I'm a fifth generation farmer and I'm from a big family. So we spent all my young years actually going out with dad on farms around the Waikato and got very interested in health and farming and agriculture. And I think that's led me into becoming a veterinarian. In fact, my sister had done that as well. And I look at what I've done since then, which practices a large animal veterinarian, went through the shear milking system in New Zealand, went to go farming. It was either a decision to go to your reef farming in Canterbury at the time or across to, to Australia. My husband and I went over to Australia and farmed in southwest Victoria with many other Kiwis uh, from the late 90s through to 2010. And that was an impactful time of my life because at the time so I had three kids so we went through two one in a hundred year droughts we had a couple of dairy farms the government had water clawbacks so irrigation water was getting clawed back and we had really quite a challenging climate for 10 years did actually really well and decided we were always going to come back to New Zealand when the kids were about 13 so that's when we came back in 2010. Now I look back and I think that's what New Zealand's now facing with climate volatility, over-allocated water. Our systems that used to work in a kind climate don't work anymore so well and they're a lot riskier. So the other thing is that having practices at room, I learned that diagnostic process and my passion lay in understanding the land and the water better and that link to human health and nature's health. And the subsequent 10 years has really been applying that. I did a master's in freshwater ecology and policy and using my diagnostic skills, I now apply that to catchments or landscapes. And it's quite a neat transfer of skills. And I'm really enjoying the work that I'm doing from the mountains to the sea. 
Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you, Alison. And there's so many parallels there from our veterinary background, our journey through farming, bringing up three children on the land and that real passion for the holistic systems approach to sustainability and our environment and how it all interacts. So yeah, it's quite amazing connecting with you and being able to talk about this today. Yeah, sustainability is a big word and it can mean a lot of different things to different people. Yeah, it is. What does it mean to you? Sustainability now really means learning to live in a way that we protect resources for future generations in a rapidly changing world. And if I just jump back to the 10 years in Australia from 1997 to 2010, we struck extreme the climate and even a lot of the Kiwis that went across there had to learn to roll with the punches, which was not something we had to do in New Zealand so much when we were farming because we had a kind climate. But when we get volatility, we have to learn to work together, come together and look after each other in what is going to be an increasingly volatile world. So Sustainability is about looking after your heart and is about being ready to change and adjust with what nature's going to throw at us. And we've got to look after nature in a reciprocal way as well. Yeah, and what a meaningful connection to be able to experience that head of what we're seeing now in New Zealand by you're having that experience over in Australia and that climate volatility. It's just of such benefit to bring that back here when you're starting to see these sort of patterns occurring in the New Zealand agricultural sector. So you discussed there your link to agriculture and you're from a multi-generational farming family. So I guess the next question is probably irrelevant, but how I'd split this for other people is actually talking about first memories on farm. So I wonder if you could just touch on those first memories. Yeah, that's quite cool because I never went to kindergarten. I spent the whole time in the back of Dad's car going around horse studs on the Waikato and lots of little dairy farms. I also was fortunate enough we spent every weekend on Mum's dairy farm as well, where there was a lot of history. Her great grandfather actually was heavily involved in the Christchurch Central Dairy Company for twenty three years. Actually, he was the chair of it, and we used to get all the stories and look at the old pictures of them draining the swamps around Alabama and Taitapu and the establishment of the old cream factory. So those were my first formative years. Quite fortunate to be in the family I was on, really, to be able to look back across 100 years, even as a child. And now, having gone through farming myself and with my family, I suppose those first links, now give me the ability to be able to look across almost 150 years, but also my experience in Australia, give me the courage to be able to look forward to what's coming and the type of change we're going to have to make in New Zealand to adjust with what's going to be a rapidly changing climate. I'm so envious of that upbringing and that childhood because I'm from an urban background, interestingly, from the Waikato as well. And I do remember driving past all of the different horse studs and dairy farms through the Waikato as a young child, but had a a degree of separation there at that point. But now I hope my children's memories are the same, being dragged around from vet call to vet call and being sent out on the farm to do all sorts of jobs. In fact, they're out on the farm at the moment, out in the yards with dad and our worker. So they are busy little bees and I hope that they do reflect on that when they're older and it serves them well with a skill set to go forward. I'm certain they will. We like to put our guests in the hot seat, and I was wondering if you could please tell us your funniest story relating to farming or agriculture. It is funny. When I was thinking back, when you said, what was my start, first connections with agriculture, I was thinking, yeah, it was those first five years, and that's probably where the funniest story was too, because he'd make me sit in the car when he was treating wild Angus mothers that had just had a calf, and... I just jumped in on all the surgical gear and you know what it was like, all the junk in the back seat. And then this Angus cow came tearing around the car trying to get me and she was circling and circling. <laughs> she just charged through, put her head through the blimmin' 
back door because I'd left it open getting in there in such a hurry, you know, as a four and a half year old. She plumb and took the door off and had the door around her head. She was just, oh gosh. <laughs> That's probably one of the funniest things that happened. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your journey through your veterinary career and farming career and into forming your own business, Tipu Whenua. So I started out as a vet and practiced as a large animal vet. At the same time, she milking in the Waikato with my husband and working on a number of farms before we made the decision to go to Australia. And then, so farming there as well with those experiences I mentioned and then coming back to New Zealand and in Australia, I was looking at what was happening around Lake Taupo and the challenge between agriculture and the receiving environment, obviously water being a big focus in the 2000s when intensification was happening in Canterbury and the co-governance of the Waikato River also occurred in that period. And I was watching that and I was thinking, I really need to understand, really need to educate myself a bit more about how water and agriculture work together. So that's when I did my master's. So I came back in 2010 and did a master's on exactly that point. My study was what is the most efficient and lowest footprint dairy farm in the upper Waikato that is also the most resilient in changing climate and changing milk prices because I could see that we were just going to be running into volatility. So I went with 25 great farmers in Reparoa, who I used to be the vet for, and they, they were really neat guys to work with because they said, Alison, we trust you with our animals. We'll trust you now to help understand our farm systems. So I got my master's in water ecology and it seemed understood what farms were the most resilient. And that probably then stepped me into what was an agricultural company who was intellect at the time, who then became Headlands through that process. And we worked with 40 different vets around ag side, ag consultants, and helped them understand what sustainability really meant for farming with the incoming policies that were coming around water. So did quite a lot of training and coaching of ag consultants in the sustainability space. And then I set up my own company, Tipu Whenua. So Tipu is regeneration and Whenua is the land, which includes water. And I just thought, we're not going to get this right until we all come together and we all work together. And so that was 2015. I set that up and since then I've been working in that as well as did a sideline of previous years working as head of environment for Langcourt, which was a hugely rewarding experience as well. So getting back to Tipu Whenua, in a way it's really coming into its own now because you see that the only way that we can have resilient farming is not to work from an industry sector perspective, but to look at the landscape, the Whenua, and say, what is the most suitable way to be a good steward for this land and look at the options of, okay, if it's got a lot of steep slopes on it, maybe we shouldn't be running animals on that. Or those river valleys, yes, are more appropriate for a little bit more intensification, let's say there are sheep or beef or running the dairy cows through there. But looking at the landscape, it's biophysical strengths and weaknesses in developing an integrated land plan. Now to do that, that means that we have to bring all the sectors together because you might have forestry, you might have dairying, you might have some dry stock, you might have some horticulture on there. And I think we're just getting to that point where each industry sector has got to work together for farmers that are managing contiguous blocks of land. And I know you just mentioned before like your deer and sheep and beef farming, you've probably got some arable stuff on your farm. So you've got four potentially different enterprises on that, that one contiguous land block. We can't have industries working against one another. We've all got to be working together. And that's really was the theme of Tipu Whenua. Yeah, once again, so ahead of your time there with that, not taking the siloed approach to things. And I think, as you say, we're just coming into our own now as an agricultural sector, actually starting to really come together and not be so divided. So it's certainly very valuable, the work you're doing. And I'm curious, this... The one health approach you applied from your business, was that something you've always had? Has it come from your sort of veterinary diagnostic background or is it something you've developed? To be fair, it probably came from a lot of things that I learned from watching my father as a veterinarian at the age of five. He'd make me get out the car and look at the animals he was looking at and he would what do you say? And I'd try and describe what I was saying, you know, just the cows with sore feet or whatever. 
And then he'd say, look at what's around them. And then you go, oh, yes, I can see that it's deep and some wet bits on that track. He'd ask me about the contours, so I'd have to look at the environment. And then he'd ask me about the farmer. How's the farmer coping with this? So I was being taught and trained to look at health not as a singular problem in one silo, but as a landscape issue and how it affected everybody that was in that system. And I know this sounds fairy ish but I fully believe that those first five years and the way that I was questioned by my father trying to get me to see things in a far more holistic way has now given me the courage to look at catchments in a holistic way and use my diagnostic skills that I learned as a veterinarian and the health understanding how everything she does connect as a system. And interestingly, now we've got to start looking at things with a Te Ao Māori lens as well. And it's really looking at things as systems. Everything is connected. So everything's come together in the last half century of my life to help me have a far wiser approach to how we do things. That's probably it. That's why now I'm trying to deal with things that are catchment scale. So we've got a catchment project here on the coastal Bay of Pinti which was funded by Jobs for Nature and also our community trusts here in Rotorua, dealing with one of the second most degraded catchments in New Zealand, which is down at Pukahina in the little Waihi Street. And there's 34,000 hectares of land there that runs from the Rotorua Lakes down to the sea. Ironically, it's probably the wealthiest catchment in New Zealand as well because there's a lot of kiwi fruit there, a lot of horticulture, highly intensified land. But one of the worst estuaries in the country as well. So wonderful to have such a strong role model in those formative years to be able to instill that skill set into you and then to be able to implement that into your life and your work, especially at that holistic attachment level, which really relates to the next question. The whole story's work and this podcast series in particular is based around the framework of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And this episode in particular is focused on goal number 14. Now, this is a really interesting one because in the infographic, it just refers to life below water. But what the goal actually is, is about conserving and sustainably using the oceans, marine resources and seas. So it's actually about the ocean water. And so it's really interesting to speak to you today from a catchment perspective, how we look at our mountains to sea approach and the targets underlying that goal and the work that you're doing within those. Yeah, it's a good opportunity to describe the one house concept from the mountains to the sea with the catchment that I'm working in. Um, and because if you think about the pathway of water from Rotoiti Lake Rotoehu, that then come out into the catchment midway in the catchment. In the coastal Bay of Plenty, we've got very young volcanic free draining soils, the pumice, and the water that comes from the lakes, it's got a little bit of nitrogen in it, for example, but when it's burst through in springs midway through the catchment, it's already had quite a lot of leakage and then it flows to the estuary. So it's the water that not only comes from the source to the sea, but also it's the activities on those young soils that is making its way into the shallow groundwater, which is also making its way to the sea. Down at Estuary, we've got high nutrient loads taking some of the essential life support system for the pippies down in the estuary that are needed for human food. Now, that's a nitrogen one, and also on the way through in our catchment, I'm doing a lot of drinking water testing in shallow bores in rural areas. What we're finding is probably 25% of drinking water just out of people's taps on farms showing signs of significant enrichment, not only with nitrogen, but also E. coli. And that's a typical thing that we're seeing. This is joining up what's happening with the land, with the water and the human health. And there's a lot of talk about also higher incidence of cancer and preterm births, et cetera, with nitrogen enriched water. So in a way, the research and the scoping studies that we're doing there is bringing together that whole one health story and that basically what we're doing on the land is affecting the people. And I'll also just mention the pitties 
And that was one of the key focuses of this whole project. There's also a very high E. coli burden on those puppies, and they're not able to be safely eaten at any time during the year. Everything is connected again, and the whole story of one house from mountains to the sea, depending on what activity we're doing, everything's got a knock-on effect. We can't try and fix things by having a massive wetland down just before the estuary. We've got to be dealing with things at the source. And you as a veterinarian would know that as much as anyone that we have to get what the causative agent is that's creating a problem that's making either the water or the puppy unsustainable for human health. Yeah, it's not just all about those Band-Aid solutions. What you spoke to there so eloquently really summarised target 14.1, which is preventing and significantly reducing marine pollution of all kinds, in particular from land-based activities, and also 14.2, which was around sustainably managing and protecting marine and coastal ecosystems to avoid significant adverse impacts which includes strengthening resilience and taking action for restoration. And that's why you are the perfect guest to speak to this goal today. No, oh, thank you. I'm so fortunate. In a lot of cases, there hasn't been good monitoring. So in the last two years, we've been doing a lot of monitoring of nitrates at different parts of the catchment, of people's drinking water and shellfish testing. So now we've got a huge repository of evidence to say these things are really bad. And the next step is that I'd like to be looking at things such as lepto to make its way from the land and the water and the animals right through and be amplified in some of those fish marine bivalves as well. It's a really good example of you can't manage what you don't measure. And until we have a really clear picture of all the components that make up where we are and set in place a good monitoring system, it's really important to actually making progress, setting that baseline and then how do we monitor it going forwards. And yeah, I love the integration there of the zoonotic potential because our human health is so linked to our the health of our food and the health of our land. And so it is that one health approach where actually it's all interconnected. In looking at all of the United Nations SDGs, which one of those do you align with most personally? I think really around how we respond to climate, but all of those are important to me because I don't like to have things working away in silos. I like a transdisciplinary approach because we're not going to fix things looking from one siloed optic. So I'm sorry, my answer isn't going to pick out favourites. It's going to say all of them are important, but they need to be working together. It's a trick question, to be honest, because you're so interlinked. It's really hard to pull one out from the other. And I find lots of people really struggle. And that's the point in a way, because you cannot pick one without taking the others along with you. Here's a really curly question for you then. What do you see as the biggest challenge to New Zealand's agricultural sector regarding sustainability? And how would you flip the script on that and turn it into an opportunity? Yeah, it's quite a deep question because I would say the biggest challenge is farmers feeling optimistic right at the moment. And I know that when and when we can feel like we've got a positive journey ahead and something to look forward to and we've got really good leadership and we've got really good support, we all innovate really well. And right now and for the next 10 years, we're all going to have to innovate. So we have to be in a safe space. And we have to look after ourselves. So I would say well-being, safety, political and business certainty are probably the biggest challenges. I'm confident New Zealand will get through this. But I feel like for the last 10 years, sectors have been protecting their own patch. And I am really honest that in doing that, industry leaders, probably policies that were made, but industry leaders trying to protect their own space has made it quite unsafe for farmers now because we've got so much compliance hitting them, but it's not necessarily meaningful regulation. It's not necessarily regulation that's going to have a net gain on the environment. So I think we are facing a lot of compliance paperwork without the net environmental gain that we need. And we've got a lot of farmers feeling very embattled and almost catatonic 
whereby they're not in an innovative space. So they are just wanting to hunker down, oh, get out. And that's a really big danger because we need our farmers. We need our farmers to be on the land, feeling safe, innovating and adapting. So I suppose that comes back down to people like ourselves that have got the courage and I suppose the safety to be thinking outside the square. So one thing we're doing at the moment with a number of other farmers is experimenting with how we can retire some of our steep land at really low cost into natives because that's a challenge. I find in my recent work in the catchment, we've got 6,000 hectares of steep land that needs to be retired from pasture to exotics or natives. And a lot of farmers do want to go to natives, but at 30,000 a hectare, they're not going to do it. We're trying to get that cost down to about $6,000 a hectare to restore steep hillsides and vulnerable landscapes into natives, which brings it into a more competitive line with exotics. And there's a lot of resistance on farm to be planting swathes of exotics on those steep and vulnerable landscapes. So again, this is about all of us working together, trying to find solutions that we know are going to work for us as we diversify our landscapes, but create more resilient farming systems. I think that's that real strength as a farmer yourself, being able to see the challenges within the challenges and actually take those on and be able to try and find opportunity within that and create really meaningful work and meaningful outcomes for the agricultural sector. So yeah, that's really cool and probably leads me nicely into the next question, which is what's on the cards for you then for the next 12 months? Good question, because I've really been toying with how we communicate things in a simple but meaningful way doesn't threaten people. We've moved on from academic papers, I have to say, because who actually reads them now? They're important and it's important to gather really robust evidence, etc., and know you have the facts behind you. But what's on the cards for me in the next 12 months is really understanding how we communicate a lot of these learnings that we're gathering through these catchment programs and other things that all of us are experimenting with at home or on our farms. How do we communicate these innovative and novel ideas in a way to the wider audience. And I'm finding that short videos on your phone, and I might be diverging here, but a short video in three minutes, you can get across a whole lot of visual, a feel-good story of someone doing something with a bit of evidence that you know is working, but also frame it that this is not proven, we're experimenting on our farms, but it gives people the sense of innovation safety, comfort, and inspiration, which I think were some of your words right at the beginning. How do we bring this back? So, yeah, it's moving into short videos, stories, maybe even longer educational videos and films. That's where I'm moving to in the next 12 months. That's really cool. It's all about reimagining knowledge transfer and how do we meet people where they're at in a way that's easy for them to digest and fit around an already busy lifestyle. Yeah, I think videos are a really cool one and really engaging. And most people have got a smartphone on hand, so it can take good quality video content out and about these days. And yeah, try and get these innovative ideas out to a wider audience. I look forward to seeing what comes out in that space. So we'd like to leave our listeners back down at the ground level with these conversations. And I think it'd be really nice to hear from you, Alison. What is one practical take-home action that farmers within their farming businesses can take to contribute to sustainability? There's no one answer to how we get sustainable with what's coming because a lot of us are still stuck in old practices that worked for the last 50 years, but the next 10 years are going to be a lot different. So the take-home action, I would say, is start experimenting. Start trialling things that are fun and not broad scale, even if it's just a paddock or a couple of paddocks or a couple of things that you're trying on your farm or like you're in a breeding thing or trying a different animal in the mix or whatever. Start experimenting because if we're not starting to innovate and growing our own confidence and courage and doing things differently, I don't think we're going to be farming and flipping the script, starting to do something differently is going to be what gives us resilience and hope for the future. 
I just love that answer so much. What served us up till now is not going to be what serves us into the future. And it's really important that we reconnect with an open mind to having a play with a bit of safe to fail trials and small scale options for innovation and fun back into farming. There's some pretty cool stuff we can do and we are a very innovative bunch with really good heads on our shoulders. So exploring where that takes us is a great take home action. So thank you so much for that, Alison. No, it's a pleasure. So that wraps up this episode, but I would like to take the opportunity to thank you for your generosity of time, of wisdom, of insights into your career to date and the work you're doing. And I'm sure there will be many more meaningful outcomes to come from all of your hard mahi, Alison. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Whole Story Podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it and are feeling inspired and optimistic about putting sustainability into practice on farm. I have one last request for you before you go. Make sure whatever platform you're listening to us on that you hit follow and share the show or episodes with your friends so that together we can grow our community and inspire sustainability and agriculture in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And thanks again to FMG for partnering with The Whole Story so that we could bring this podcast to life for you all to enjoy. Catch you next time.